Dr. Boxer received his MD and PhD degrees from the NYU Medical Center. He completed his res residency in neurology at Stanford University and a fellowship here in the behavioral neurology of UCSF. He's an associate professor of neurology and the Vera and John Graziadio Scholar in Alzheimer's Disease Research. He directs the clinical trials program here at the Memory and Aging Center, and he's also interested in how eye movements and neuroimaging measures with the study of pathophysiology of various dementias, in particular in PSP and CBD. So I uh, wanted to thank Christine for putting together this really terrific meeting and just congratulations, Christine, because you've done a terrific job. And I also wanted to thank Robin Riddle and the Brain Support Network and um, Sharon, Sharon Reichert as well uh, for all your support. We really appreciate it. Um, and you know, I think, I hope that everyone in the room really realizes that we're all in this together and we, we can't do any of this without all of your help and participation. And, and we really owe everyone here a great deal of thanks. So a thank you for putting up for traveling down here, for um, you know, staying in hotels, for having us stick you with needles, putting you in scanners, and um, all of the hours and hours of testing we put you through. It, it really does help, and we've made, I think, tremendous progress over the past uh, 10 years. And I think what I want to tell you is that I think I and others have never been more excited about potentially having some effective therapies for tau-related disease. And I think uh, within the next year or two, we're going to see some really, really exciting new therapies that are going to come into human testing. And, and I hope that maybe in three or four years, five years, um, we might have the last meeting like this ever where we'll all just have a party and say, yeah, these diseases are over and we cured them and thanks. So um, maybe that's a little optimistic. but. <laughs> That's, that's my goal, and I think probably everyone else is here. So um, you heard from uh, Dr. Miller and others that um, tau protein is really um, central to many different diseases of aging, and even we're learning more and more to uh, diseases that affect our athletes and our veterans, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And um, this suggests that tau itself, this protein that you, you've seen, is really probably one of the best targets that we know of for most neurological diseases, for developing a treatment that if we could affect tau, we might be able to cure or, or at least make many of these diseases better. And we were not the first ones to think of this, and um, the drug uh, pharmaceutical industry is um, very interested in this as well, and has actually spent also many decades thinking about tau, and really focused on Alzheimer's disease because this is a little bit more common than PSP and CBD. And what, one of the things that we've been doing here at UCSF is trying to convince the pharmaceutical industry that has billions of dollars of, of Wall Street's money that they shouldn't be wasting it all on Alzheimer's disease. They should be spending more on PSP and CBD. And the reason why is because there are really no diseases that are more strongly linked to tau than PSP and CBD. And so all of these years of research from here, from elsewhere, um, have, have come up with a lot of really exciting possibilities and drugs that are um, well advanced in different animal models, um, as well as uh, some that have entered clinical trials or we expect will be within the next year. So this is a neuron. I, hope, I don't know if you can see. Let's see. Um, so this is a nerve cell, a typical nerve cell in the brain. And these things here, these lines are called microtubules. And these are kind of like the train tracks that the cell uses to move important proteins around and energy. And it also helps the neuron to ma maintain its sort of tree-like structure. And what tau does is tau somehow uh, helps to stabilize these microtubules and regulate them, sort of like the switches on a train track. And so something goes wrong in PSP and CBD and these other brain diseases where tau falls off the microtubules, clumps up, and causes disease. And so there are different strategies for treating tau-related disease. And probably what we think is the most exciting possibility are, are treatments that could uh, potentially remove tau, because we think this toxic, sticky tau is somehow uh, harming the cells and causing these microtubules to fall apart. And so um, uh, one of the most exciting things that we think we're going to see probably in the next year are 
are immunological approaches, so what we call antibodies, that may actually even be able to remove this sticky, toxic tau before it spreads from one cell to another. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of some of the more current approaches that we're using now um, that are actually aimed at making up for the loss of tau and helping these microtubules to uh, function better in the setting of tau that's damaged in these diseases. And so um, I think I don't probably need to tell most people about what PSP is, but um, you know, when I go and talk to the pharmaceutical industry and other researchers, I, I really want to drive home the point that there is no disease that is more tightly linked to tau in terms of genetics, neuropathology, uh, and uh, you know, what we think in terms of treatment targets than PSP. And so we've really focused heavily on PSP and CBD, which is really its very close cousin. Um, uh, in our, all of our studies trying to develop therapies. And this shows just down here, this is the distribution of tau protein that we typically see in a PSP patient with Richardson syndrome at autopsy. And uh, really uh, the same areas that Dr. Rabinovich showed you earlier um, uh, with his uh, tau imaging agent. So um, I want to tell you about really the, uh, uh, what we think was a landmark study of a treatment that was meant to uh, stabilize microtubules, and this was divunatide. This was a study that we organized here and we uh, did with a lot of our uh, researchers, a lot of help from researchers around the world. And um, this, was a pro this was a drug that was derived from a growth factor that helps uh, the brain develop, and it was actually a small protein that was developed by uh, a researcher in Israel and then uh, made into a nasal spray that we delivered uh, to patients hoping that it would help them to do better with their PSP. Uh, because in animals that had tau-related uh, degeneration, it actually helped them to do better. Um, and I know that many people here were involved in this study. Some people probably participated or had family members who participated. So I thought you'd want to hear the results and hear a little bit more about it. Um, this was uh, really uh, an important study for many reasons. One of them was that this was the first study that we took to the Food and Drug Administration, which really has the responsibility for approving a drug and allowing us to market it, that would have, had it been positive, this would have allowed us to market this as the first real treatment for PSP. And um, it seems like sort of a technical point, but as we try and convince the pharmaceutical industry and Wall Street to invest in PSP and CBD, this is a really important point, that this is something that they should really be investing in and that we can really make happen for them. And so they should take their billions of dollars and, and move them into this disease. Uh, so what we did is we uh, enrolled 313 patients with PSP. They had typical Richardson syndrome. Uh, this was done on three continents here in North America, Europe, and in Australia. And we followed them for a year and we used sort of typical clinical rating scales and um, as well as MRI scans and even uh, uh, a spinal fluid test to see whether the drug worked. And 50% of the patients received the drug, 50% received a, a matching placebo, and none of us knew uh, who got the drug uh, during the course of the study. It wasn't until the last patient finished the last day of treatment that we found out, and that was just about a year ago that we were able to find out what happened. Um, uh, so uh, this is, these are all the sites around the world. You can see in Europe, and Germany, France, England, um, and everything eventually uh, came back here to San Francisco, and we now have all the data and all the information from the study, which is probably the largest and best characterized population of PSP patients ever collected. So it's really also very valuable to our future studies. Um, unfortunately, what we found is that there was really absolutely no benefit, no matter how we looked at it, um, on sort of a typical uh, rating scale, what we call the PSP rating scale or the Schwab and England scale. You can, there's a, the blue line is the drug treated uh, patients and the black is a placebo. And these are really just right about on top of each other. There was no difference. Um, and we found no, no benefits of the drug on really any of the measures. And this was, I think, disappointing, but not so unusual in clinical trials. And, um, although it was uh, negative, we didn't find a benefit of the drug, we really showed that we could do a trial like this and that we could do it efficiently and get a clear result. And this is really important as we get more promising drugs to show that we have the ability to do this and we can get a clear answer very quickly. 
Um, I mentioned that uh, this study allowed us to collect more data on imaging, on clinical features, on disease progression of PSP, almost that probably has ever existed in the world on PSP. And for instance, for MRI scans, we have about 200 MRI scans of people who are followed longitudinally. And what we learn, and this is really, these are new data um, from patients in the study, and this shows the areas of the brain in PSP that change over one year. And we can see that, again, in the brain stem and the cerebellum here, these are the areas that are really um, losing brain volume the most quickly, about 7 to 9 percent over the course of a year. And um, this amount of data that we collected for the study is, is um, over 10 times more data than ever existed uh, before. And so really, um, although it was a negative study, we learned a huge amount and we're using this to, to design better studies in the future. Um, so I think uh, another thing that we've learned is, is how really we can convince the FDA to uh, approach uh, new drugs and what the pathway should be sort of from a legal and regulatory perspective. And I know this is a busy slide, I won't take you through all of it, but what we've learned is that we can probably um, do uh, drug development much more quickly in PSP than we could, let's say, in Alzheimer's disease. And this gives us a big advantage as the more promising drugs come into human clinical trials. We think we can convince uh, the companies that own them to give them to us for the next studies because it, it won't take nearly as long or won't be nearly as difficult as in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so. Uh, I've told you really that um, we can do a good clinical trial in PSP, but what we want to do in the future is start to also look at some of these genetic tau-related syndromes that um, Dr. Geshwin told you a little bit about. We call them frontotemporal dementia with Parkinsonism linked to chromosome 17, which is a mouthful, but um, there are very rare patients who have actual mutations in the tau gene. And what we hope is that if we can learn more about them and we can study them, we might, able be, we might even be able to intervene in their disease before they have any symptoms. And this is um, called a prevention study where we might even prevent the onset of tau-related disease. And we think that this is really exciting. They're just starting to do this in Alzheimer's disease and we're trying to uh, develop the capability to do this in PSP uh, and CBD, although we just don't have enough information yet to do it. Um, but uh, Dr. Geshwin's study, I think, is going to help us to get there. Um, I know many people also have participated in our 4R tau neuroimaging initiative and the MRI technology that I just showed you a few slides ago came out of this study and it's really helping us to develop new ways to measure disease in PSP and to test the effects of new treatments and uh, again we want to thank everyone here who's participated in, in this because we're really learning a lot and I wish I had time to show you all of the great results we're getting out of uh, this study. So uh, to summarize, uh, you know, this is really probably the most exciting time ever for these diseases because I think in the next year we're going to have some really exciting new treatments targeting tau that we can test in PSP and hopefully CBD as well. And um, we've been able to show that we can test them efficiently, we can test them accurately, and we can get a clear answer as to whether they work or whether they don't work. If a treatment doesn't work, we don't want to waste our time on it. We want to move on to the next treatment, and there are plenty of treatments out there now. So uh, we think that this is really exciting, and uh, stay tuned. Please keep in touch with us if you think you might be interested in participating in a treatment trial. I'm not permitted to describe any of the new ones that we'll be starting this year yet, but I hope that in a few months we'll be able to tell you about the first one. So uh, keep in touch. Uh, Lisa Voltarelli, who's in the back, will, uh, would be happy to collect name and contact information for anyone who wants to be kept posted on, on our progress in this regard. And thank you again for coming today.